Here we are on a new episode of Insider Info with the Legal Amity. And I'm here interviewing Joe Sidhu, who's a criminal barrister. Hi, Anjali. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Sidhu, uh, QC. I'm a senior barrister who bar for some 27 years, specialising in criminal defence. So I've had uh, the opportunity and the privilege of dealing with cases from the entire uh, range of criminal law, everything from shoplifting at the very bottom to what I do these days, which is mainly homicide cases, terrorism, large-scale frauds and conspiracies involving drugs. Well, thank you so much. And especially again, once again, I really appreciate your time on such a busy day to take the time out to speak to us. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and ask you the first question of what drew you to criminal law? For me, I think the driver really was how I saw law being very much part of my own sort of view of the world. I came from a very humble community in West London, a town called Southall, which is many people will know, had a very high immigrant uh, community there. I went to state school. Uh, I had lots of interesting experiences. Of course, I, I grew up in an age as well because of how old I am, when there were lots of problems in society and lots of difficulties, particularly for minorities. And I could see that there were challenges that needed to be confronted. Uh, and I felt that being a lawyer was one of the best ways, in fact, to contribute to society. Because as a lawyer, you get to know what is in fact, the, what are the rules? What, are the, what, what is the framework that actually governs our society? And if you can navigate your way through those rules, if you've got a good grasp of the principles of law, it puts you in a very confident position to be able to talk about the law, to confront injustice when you see it, to deal with discrimination if you find it anywhere. And very importantly, Anjali, Anjali for me, as a, as a criminal advocate, an essential part of the toolkit of being a lawyer was to be actually somebody who speaks in court. I've always felt that you could probably make more of a direct impact on people's lives if you stand on the front line. And that comes with a lot of responsibility and yes, it comes with a lot of stress as well. These days I spend most of my time representing people charged with murder. So you can imagine the stakes in the cases that I do. So the pressures on the advocate are quite intense but I've always said to myself that if you, if you can't deal with pressure, then don't be a lawyer because the law is a profession in which it's, there's always lots of pressures. There's pressures from all sides. You've got to keep your clients happy. You've got to keep the court happy. You've got to be on top of your game. You need to know what you're doing. And if you aren't put off by that, and in fact drawn by that level of responsibility, then I've always felt that the law is a great profession to enter. And if you care about liberty and justice, then crime is one of the best sectors of law to move into. I'll say this to you, Anjali, there's a lot of grafting. And the grafting is because when you are a criminal lawyer and doing the sharp end of justice, the challenges that you face are sometimes quite intense. The pressures on your shoulders, the expectations of you. You're not just dealing with clients, you're dealing with their families. You're dealing with sometimes, you know, uh, a prosecutor who can be quite heavy handed if you're defending. And you've got a judge who's watching the whole process and you can't really miss a step because when you're in court, everyone's looking at you, everyone's watching and everything you say is being recorded. And all of you, I'm sure know that we've had lots of problems in the country in the last few years with legal aid being cut by successive governments. There's an enormous amount of pressures within the system. And that means that people who choose to do criminal law take a deep breath before they step into the arena. There are there's not money in this. There's, it's not a, an area of law that you do because you want to make money. Most of the work that you do is going to be legally aided. So there must be something else that's inside you that's driving you if you want to come into criminal law. There's got to be an impulse, a passion, that you see yourself as an activist lawyer, a lawyer who wants to stand on the front line and confront injustice. If that's something that you shy away from, if that's something that's not really appealing to you, then perhaps criminal law isn't the best thing to do. When you're making a judgment, I always say, Anjali, when I speak to students who are doing law, you're making a judgment. It's a, it's a kind of risk assessment. Anjali, it's only one in 14 people who apply for a pupillage who actually get one. That's about 7%. Wow. That means 93% of law graduates who do the bar exams who want to come to the bar, 93% aren't making it at the first attempt. So you've got to be very brave. Our second question, I'm not too sure if you would have a typical day as such, but if you were, what would that sort of look like for you? 
So a typical day for me would be very different for, uh, from a typical day for a junior barrister. Uh, okay. For me, a typical day is going to court on a murder trial, going to court in the morning and afternoon, but having done usually a lot of prep the night before. And when you're at the criminal bar, it is often the case that you work until the early hours of the morning. So you're burning the midnight oil. When I was a junior barrister, I often went without sleep or maybe even just one hour of sleep before I, you know, I, I, I got myself up in the morning, showered, changed, got my suit on, grabbed my bag and then left the house. And, and so a typical day can be very different depending on where you are on the ladder. If I think back to my junior days, which I think is very similar to what junior barristers experience now, even now, I would say to a typical day would be uh, me rushing out of the house, getting down to court, hoping that I won't be late, um, making sure that I meet my client as quickly as I can when I get to court. If they're on bail, you're going to cross your fingers and hope they turn up. If they're in custody, they'll be brought in a prison van. So I'd go down to the court cells to meet them, take some instructions from them, go into court. And, and do what I need to do. If it's a trial or it's a short hearing, it may be a sentencing hearing where I have to do a plea and mitigation, or I might be doing a bail application. Having done all of that work and represented the client, I might be finishing at court by 4.30 or five o'clock. I might have got lunch that day if I'd been able to nip <laughs> out to grab a sandwich. I'll always take a bottle of water with me at least to stay, hi to stay hydrated. And then I'll go, go home and then I'll be told what my next case for the following day will be which will involve me usually sitting, eating my dinner with a file open uh, and preparing it until whatever time I need. So I think if you are conscientious and you are uh, serious about the job and you don't want to let your client down, uh, usually the reality will be, Anjali, that other parts of your life are what have to give way. Deep satisfaction that you are playing an important part within the system. If you think of the justice system as an ecosystem, it has lots of component parts, Anjali. You've got the judge, you've got the, you've got the jury, you've got the, the advocates, you've got the court staff, you've got the prison, you've got the probation service, you've got your client, you've got the members of the public, you've got the media, you've got everybody who comes together in a, in a sort of mosaic to create what we call a justice system. And each of us, has to make their contribution to keep that system afloat, to keep it moving, to keep it on the rails. So your sense of, of professional satisfaction at the end of the day is the, is the exhilaration of knowing that without you, without you doing your job that day, that system would not have been able to operate. What has been your most interesting case thus far that you could talk about? Angela, after 27 years, it, it, it's quite extraordinary when I look back at what might be described as a sort of bibliography um, <laughs> of all, all the cases I've done. Uh, whether it's been a small case uh, or a big case, every case involves human beings with their own stories. I had to choose one in recent years. It would be the case of Sabah Khan, which has been, in fact, covered in a number of television documentaries because it was such an awful case. I represented a young woman who was uh, prosecuted for murdering her own sister. And it was come across a murder in which a sister had killed her own sister. Um, you know, they shared a home where the elder sister who died had four children and she was married to a man that was, she was married to by arrangement in, in their culture. And the younger sister, Saba Khan, who I represented, unfortunately ended up in an affair with her brother-in-law. And because she was in an affair with him, she fell in love with him. She began to resent her older sister. And ultimately, she was looking for ways in which she could get rid of her sister. And you couldn't imagine a, a, a more awful way for a family to descend from what was originally a happy, warm, harmonious uh, unit of people into this appalling abyss into which the client that I represented fell. Thinking about my career and, and what case really affected me and, and troubled me, it was, it was this, because it meant, Anjali, that I realized there are, in fact, no lines left that can't be crossed. The idea that a sister could take a knife to her own sister and stab her 68 times told me that really there is no limit to what human beings are capable of doing. Wow, thank you so much for that. That was, that was a really interesting case, Tin. I'm really interested in actually reading up more on that because it is surprising, like you say, what people are capable of. Wow. Um, 
But thank you. I just want to thank you for your time and for answering all of our questions to as much detail as you can. I'm sure this is going to be so helpful to people who want to be a barrister, or people who want to specialise in criminal law. So thank you once again. You're very welcome, Angelina. And I would say to all of your fellow students, one of the most important things you can do to make good decisions about your career going forwards so that you don't end up making mistakes and regretting them later is to collect good quality information from people who are on the inside of the industry. So speak to barristers, speak to solicitors, particularly speak to the junior ones because they're the ones who've gone through the process most recently. Just think very carefully about what you like, what are you interested in when you're studying at university and whether you feel it's better for you to become a solicitor or to become a barrister. Get all that information together, put it onto a sort of almost like a bank balance where you've got <laughs> credits and debits. And then when you get to the last line on that page and you make that decision, know that you made the decision rationally and logically. Yes, it's important to use your heart sometimes, <laughs> but don't let your heart rule your head.